Uh, Professor James Small was born in 1945 on Arcadia Plantation, located on the banks of the Waccamaw River. This lowland rice plantation is located where the Waccamaw, Petey, and Black Rivers converge to meet the Atlantic Ocean on the shores of historic Georgetown, South Carolina. Professor Small was born to a family that traces their descent from the enslaved Africans of the Europa, Akan, and Ibe people of West Africa. Professor Small's heritage also stems from the Native American ancestors that inhabited the South Carolina Carolinian shores. Both his maternal great-grandmother and his paternal great-grandmother were members of the Chikara Nation and made their home along the mighty Waccamaw River. Professor Small graduated from the all-black Howard High School in Georgetown, South Carolina in 1964. He then served in the U.S. Navy for two years during the Vietnam era. Upon his release from military service, Professor Small moved to New York City where he joined the organization of Afro-American Unity founded by the legendary Malcolm X. In 1967, Professor Small became Imam, a minister of the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, also founded by Malcolm X. In 1975, Professor Small traveled to the holy city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia to make his holy pilgrimage to Hajj. And now I would like to introduce you and bring forward my brother, Professor Small. Thank you. 
Assembly by a fascist committee. And we want to pretend that ain't happening. We want to play the fake hope game that ain't real. It makes you feel good, but it ain't real. And because of the activity of those corporate entities that run this country and has hijacked this government, if you go back over the last 25 years and add up the dead bodies of just the black males on the board, you will be in the middle. Now, they tell us about the five killed this week in LA and the 10 this week in DC and the 15 up in New York and the 12 in Cincinnati or Detroit, but at the end of the year, with this kind of thing happening every week, how many young black men alone, I'm not even getting to the system, that's dead from violence, that was induced by narcotics, that is controlled by the very government that we want to pay homage and respect to. I would dare to say that in the last 30 years, we are bordering on any year of the Middle Passage in terms of the number of the dead and the men. But because we don't see them all together, but you take, say, one year, New York's got 2,000, Cincinnati got 1,000, uh, LA got 1,500, DC got close to 1,500, Columbus got 900, and you go on and on and on, adding up the cities in America from New Orleans to the borders of Canada, from California to the eastern coast, see how many dead young black people you have, and then add up the years until you reach the third decade and see how many of our young people we've lost. We're not counting the ones that's on drugs and non-functional. We're not counting the ones that's in the penitentiary system or the parole system, just the ones murdered. If we're going to talk about genocide, it's not a historical experience, it's a now experience. We've got to tell the truth. But it's difficult to tell the truth unless you restore your mind. You ready to roll my crown? Okay. You know, we're going to talk about religion. Sharon laid this thing out so crabby. So I'm going to do this little piece first, and then I'm going to read my piece. Now, I'm an oral person, and I learned to finally write my stuff down. So I said, well, you sound better than you didn't do it, but I tell you more when I write it down. And so I've written a speech down. But I'm going to walk you through some maps. And this is the map of Africa. And my instructions to you is that um, Now, I wanted you to see the map, but when I was using this map in my classroom, <coughs> I found that not a single African student in any of my classes for nearly 10 years could draw the map of Africa. Now, before they left my class, they could draw this map, and they couldn't put every country where they belonged. Coming into my class, I've got shapes of tomato, melon, anything, but this few could give this shape made. I'm talking at college level on this teacher, 20 years, and couldn't find 99% of black young people and old people could not draw this map, and definitely could not give me these 53 to 56 countries that we have. But for us, from this area, from Angola, straight up the Congo, Chad River, across the Mauritania, taking in Gambia, Senegal, Ghana, Guinea, Cameroon, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Gabon, Congo, Dutch, and Angola. This is where most of us come from. But a large amount of our people come from now that. And a good bit came from Ethiopia and even Kenya and Uganda. Now most of the slave trading so-called that went on, people were trapped all the way in the east and marched to the west. Months and months of March, losing almost half of that population, and losing another half bringing them across the ocean. And do that frequently for about 500 years to see what you got in terms of death. When people want to talk about genocide, or tell you you 
shouldn't talk about slavery. And definitely don't call it genocide. But we are, the African Americans, made up of the largest numbers of ethnic and cultural groups of any African people anywhere on or off the continent. Think of it now. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do with what you got. We are the largest amalgamation of Africans culturally, ethnically, and biologically of any group of Africans anywhere in the world. The Yoruba is a small gene pool. The Akan is a small gene pool. Even Africans in Jamaica, you will see it's a small gene pool. Even Haiti, an even smaller gene pool. But in North America, because we were initially brought from all the groups that was taken to the Caribbean, which represented all the different European nations that was taking us from different locations in Africa, um, but I mean, that this group here, because the British came in as a Johnny come lately and was buying from others who were established in different locations in Africa, we ended up being the African melting pot. And it is appropriate that we call ourselves African. Now we know that's not our ancient name, but it is the generic name for the entire continent. <coughs> And we do represent the largest gene pool, cultural pool, ethnic pool from that company. I don't know whether we've been conscious enough to take full advantage of it. But listen to Brother Hyde and his music. And I remember the first time I hear you, you understood it very clearly the burden, the breadth of the different rhythms that make up and pantheon of African American music. So learn the map. That should be something to teach yourself. Learn those countries. And then learn the general survey of history of each one of those countries. And it will advance your consciousness. The next one. This I wanted to show because I wanted to show you that we, regarding humanity in Africa, and we went out to populate the rest of the world. You use that. I'm <laughs> I've got a little bit in my bag of men, and I can really handle it. You know, we began humanity. We are the foundation of humanity. We are the basis. Now, if you're ashamed of that and don't want to be there, that's too bad. You cannot change that. <laughs> Everybody, every other people in the world emanate out of you. They are actually biological degenerate depreciations of you. Now, that's scientifically correctly stated. I'm not being abusive. And we care about what? Because people have been very busy to us. But you've got to understand that, that you are whatever the God is, and by the end of the day, I hope you have another God in mind that you walked in here. Whatever the God is, it made you first as the prototypical human being. Everything else human owes its beingness to you. Now you owe your beingness to the being that creates all. But all others owe their being this to you. Anthropology, archaeology, their mythology, history has all proven that to be facts. Genealogy, there's, there's no discussion on it anymore. The next one. I put this up, and this is important. So this is the Middle East. They call it the Middle East, but that's not exactly. How many people are aware that even at the time that the Hebrew tradition began, and that's very late in time, Iraq was a black population. Lebanon was a black population. What we call Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine was all historically called Canaan, a black population. Turkey was a black population. All of what is Saudi Arabia, Yemen was black population. And there's still a significant black population present in all of those areas today, though as we are in the rest of the world, we have the bottom of society. And you've got to understand that because when what you call the, the Torah, or the Hebrew tradition, was concocted, and I hope that's not disrespectful, but it was concocted by us, under duress. We were trapped with the invasion of the Hyksos, which came out of Central Asia, just north, uh, west of Afghanistan, and east of the Caspian Mountains, is where this evolution into what we call whiteness occurred. And this is where they came forth on us with the first major invasions. Well, when we found ourselves being dominated and conquered militarily 
and having our institution destroyed, we took fragments from the periphery of that institution and created what you know today as the Hebrew Israelite tradition. That was our cultural survival instrument, remembering two rules and rules and regulations of character development in order to create a character that was worthy of being before what we call God. But our enemy did not go away. They stayed long enough that they took over our system and they became the Hebrew Israelite and forced us into another resistance. So as more invasions came, by the time the Greek invasion gets to us, hundreds of years later, and then as the Greek is fading out and the Romans are coming in, we are meeting another kind of tyranny, and so we come up with the movement that you know today as Christianity. See, in the other tradition, we proclaim that a Messiah could come and liberate us from things got bad, but things got bad. And so we proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And that movement is the main Christianity. But again, we could not maintain the system because we were under domination and duress in the same way we are in America. That's why people could take your jazz and take your rap and take your hip hop and take your, um, your rag and take your blues and make it theirs. They did that then. And these systems we now call religion, which was our spiritual cult and cultural systems, they took and made it their state ideologies. And when it lost power to material ideology, then it became religion for them. The third thing is Islam. If you know the fight in Christianity around the Benedictine Empire and, and, and the Nicene Conference, and I'm not going to go into that, I'll just do that, you will find that at that conference a group of Africans, a lot of them were killed, but some of them broke away under the leadership of a man called Arius, and there was a couple of others. But the centerpiece of that was the monotheism of oneness. Well, those are the people that trained Muhammad the prophet. Now, you can call him Gabriel and whatever, you know, but that's who trained him into a way of life that was consistent with what they were fighting the Romans about. Islam became the next stage of our resistance, our psycho-spiritual resistance against tyranny and domination and occupation by other people. And it gave us our greatest victory. But the problem with that, immediately after Prophet Muhammad died, Islam was taken over by other than African people. And from the very beginning of Islam, after the death of Umar and the death of Atman, Atman itself was a coup d'etat. Umar was defending the integrity of the Prophet. Ali came to defend the integrity of the Prophet, and Ali and the black folks of Egypt, 500 men came over to support Ali, and they killed Atman. But Abu Sufyan and the others killed Mr. Ali, and then his son, etc. And Islam got taken over by other than black people. And we, for a thousand years, a terrible slavery on Africa ravaging that continent before 1492. Next one, brother. This is just an example of what happened. This was done by Brother Paul Avina years ago when we were having fun trying to develop this kind of thing over in England. And he drew this map, he did it together. Actually, in his living room, we began to toil with this. On when the explosion of the invasions came in Northeast Africa, how we ran back to the Western Sudan Central Africa and Southern Africa and the migrations. With each major invasion and conquest and occupation, there was a migration. The Hyksos, 1,700, there's a migration. The Hyksos was followed by the Hittite. We are defeated militarily again. We migrate back south. That's followed by the Persians, the Assyrians, we migrate south. The Persians, we migrate again. Each of these centuries apart wave of migration is scattering the culture that we had developed with Kemet back into the continent itself. And you will see the manifestation of those cultures in places like the Akan tradition, the Yoruba tradition, the tradition of the people of Mali, and so forth. And I just wanted to, just to give an example of us running back south when things got bad. You know, in the theater, they said, go to black. When things go bad, we went to black. Thank you, brother. This one you can't see very well, but I wanted to show you the Arabs um, from 500 to 1500, and it's that space up top where you see all the little dots. That's where the Christians are. See, we were Christians before we were Muslims. And the black people gave the Christian church Latin. That's not necessarily Roman. You need to do some linguistic studies to find the Latin had its beginning in the church in North Africa, not in Europe. And it can get even deeper than that. Much of what structures the, the, what we call the white church 
because I've been buried by African theology, that's been buried by being ethnology. So, all of what we call North Africa, that was Christian. But as this Muslim movement emerges out of Saudi Arabia, it will conquer everything around the Mediterranean. And people weren't crying about somebody bringing a new God. They were upset because this new group with a new ideology had taken over international trade and commerce. And you'll find at the time this land come on the scene, what happens to Europe? It goes into the period that it calls the Dark Ages, which was economic depression. And it lasted for years until they got involved in the slave trade in West Africa. And they got themselves off and out of it. So you need to really spend some time reading Islamic literature, read the Hebrew literature, read the Bible. As much as it's full of contradiction, they didn't think you would ever be here asking these questions, so they didn't destroy most of the good stuff our ancestors left. What they did was to take our wisdom and superimpose it over their ethno history and change the location of time when the wisdom was emanated and claim it for themselves. What you got to do, just read it cursively and you see the mess that's there. You know, you see something that's so similar to Moses. If Moses was great and all I've ever seen him was a white man, then me and God got in big trouble. How come he don't talk to Moses and won't talk to me? I'm most great up than Moses was, and I didn't kill nobody. And I didn't steal nothing from nobody. So if God don't talk to Moses, then shoot. You need to come have a conversation with me. I'm not having a serious conversation with you, or you ain't the right God. Well, I know we kind of scared to go there, like that. Because they scare us with this religion. And then go, oh, the Lord don't get you. <laughs> the Lord ain't taking our babies out of the penitentiary. And the Lord ain't taking our people off of AIDS. And the Lord ain't taking our people off of the drugs. And the Lord ain't pushing that tyranny out of our community. Now, maybe what we're doing is approaching this thing called the Lord the wrong way. That's what we're going to about. Uh, now, until we hit the next one, this is just looking at West Africa, so that as, as early as 500, Ghana, ancient Ghana, already existed as a kingdom. And those lines you see running up, those are trade routes going back to the Nile Valley. We have been training with the Nile Valley since here from West Africa to Nile Valley, Egypt, pre-Roman times. Matter of fact, one of the pharaohs, I think it's in the 18th dynasty, they talk about having a summer palace in what we know today as Mali. So they've been linkages, and, and the, the late Chad, which sits about in that area, a little, a little bit that way, late Chad has dried up considerably. But during the monsoon season 2,000 years ago, you could go by rowboat from the Niger River to the Nile River. You can almost do it today during the monsoon, during the rainy season. But go back when the desert hadn't encroached, the lake hadn't dried up, raise the level of those rivers up, you can move from the Congo, Niger, Chad River Basin tributaries into Nile Valley for a considerable amount of months a year. Which shows us that we, we could and we did communicate considerably. You know, the Yoruba said that 50%, 75% of their language, according to their scholarship, is Medinetian. You got the Ewe saying their entire language system is Medinetian, the language of ancient Nile Valley. You've got the Akan claiming both the Medjineta and the Akan and the Canaan language system, but you'll find that Hebrew is actually a Canaanite dialect mixed with Medjineta. Even the Europeans admit to that now. I used to get angry when brothers claim that that's our language, but it is ours. But it's not coming through the door others were claiming. It comes right out of the down back. Okay. We can go, I just want to invest again, that's the Niger River. This I wanted to show because once they came, you see the lines on the other side over here? This is the Arab Islamic slave trade routes, trading us as slaves into India, to China, and other islands of the Pacific, into Saudi Arabia, the so-called New Middle East, and Europe. For 1,000 years, they perfected that trade. And they handed that system over to the European as a perfected system of enslaving and debilitating and destroying societies and removing their people to do free labor for you. <coughs> On this side are the routes taken, moving us from West Africa into Central South America, North America. It's also showing the trade and commodities going back to Europe and coming back to Africa. 
with significant Atlantic Japanese was doing his research on the ships going to Africa. They had hatchets, they had um, beads, and a lot of the little tool things that we would need. But they had tobacco, they had opium, and they had rum. And in some of his writing, he found that some, what some of the sea captains would do would soak the tobacco in the opium and rum. Okay, hello. The brothers in that beast fight, they were selling anything for it. And it wasn't nailed down. And I'm not making a joke of this. In the research, we found that these were the things listed in the Congo Manifesto on the ships going from Europe back to Africa in order to buy the slave. So they were already dealing in narcotics. Sugar was a narcotic, it still is. Okay. Tobacco was a narcotic. Rum is a, is, is, is a I guess, I can't call it an alcohol, but it's also addictive. So the whole relationship with Africa was based on addiction. Yeah. And we've got to be conscious of that, real conscious of that. The stuff we see in our community now is not new. It's just another level of it carried out by the same organization. And again, this is now after the so-called transatlantic slave trade, but it was really the European slave and cap trade and captive act. Um, and the Berlin Conference was taking place in 1885. And the practice said, okay, we've gotten all we can get out of the Western world by enslaving these people. And we've used as our front. See, the, the key to this is that the primary legitimizer to European consciousness that what they were doing was right was Christianity. The primary legitimizer to Arab and North African consciousness were this land, that cutting off people's testicles, cutting our women up, enslaving people, taking their lives that they don't want from you, was sanctioned by their God. And it wasn't that one person made a mistake with this. This went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, generation after generation after generation. And if you read the literature, it was all rationalized by the theologians who were the partners with the politicians of those societies. This I put out because coming back to the Bible, remember the Bible, and um, I know it has some glances here. The Bible is an interesting document. I, I actually wrote down what the word itself meant, and I want you to hear this. The word came originally from the name of the papyrus, the papyrus. The word papyrus, uh, they refer to it in, in the Phoenician language as biblos, a reed, used extensively in, um, for making scrolls and books. So biblos, which is the Old Testament word jibo, was so named because in the Phoenician Seaport trade manufacturing in papyrus, writing was <coughs> carried on. From about the 11th century BC or even earlier, papyrus rolls growed in the delta of Egypt and it was shipped to Jibo. The word Bible comes from the old French, which comes from the Latin, which comes from this old Hebrew word Jibo, which comes from the Phoenician word Babylon, which comes from the African word Papyrus. Right? And so to mean that 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 the papyrus, we have another word for it. But it meant book. It simply meant book or reading. It did not mean something God sent down. It did not mean something so holy you cry every time you see it, you wrap in white cloth. It meant simply book. There wasn't a whole lot of people that had books back then except for white folks. So to white folks to have book, it was a big deal. So they called it book. Now, the word we know, Bible, um, by the second century, that came from the old French, by the century, second century AD, Greek Christians called the sacred scripture the Bible, the book. When this title was subsequently transferred to the Latin, it was rendered in the singular and through old French came into English as Bible. And that's what that word God that y'all dealing with too. It's a very interesting <coughs> word. In the German, the word means mighty man. They, weren't even, they couldn't even make it up to omnipotent, omnipresent. They had not that concept. If you know anything about the Vikings, they were dealing with Valhalla in that day, that the guy who could kill the most people could make it up for the good old good times that were going on. The other word out of the Anglo-Saxons 
it, it, it's the Anglo-Saxon word, the two essential and personal name of God in the Hebrew scriptures, you know, it's Elohim and, and Jehovah, more correctly, Yahweh. The first calling attention to the fullness of the divine power, and then the latter, the Yahweh, is he who is. But the word God literally means in Anglo-Saxon, good. They didn't have any word more um, suited to describe omnipotent because they had no such concept. So they were for good. And the, and the German English, so Anglo-Saxon is a Germanic um, dialect. The German word literally is mighty man. And to the mighty man to them was the one that was most good. I picked this, and this was something me and Paul Hanning. He first showed me this, I was like, yeah, I like this. Wisdom has built her house. <coughs> she has hewn out, out her seven pillars. Now, you ever wonder why the elite of the Jewish community study at yeshiva, and the primary text in the yeshiva is the Torah, or what you call the Old Testament? If you really get into it, it's basic African philosophy, physics, science, and mathematics. And because they can take it back to the language, they can break it down in a manner that's appropriate to elevate their consciousness and their intellect. But this is one of the passages to show you. This is Proverb 9.1. Wisdom has built her house. She has shown out her seven pillows. The seven pillows is the liberal arts. Music, arithmetic, geometry, grammar, astronomy, rhetoric, and dialect. I'm not even going to soap here, because that's a whole other thing that going into the whole fantasy teaching next time. Now, I put this out because when I talked about, talk about the Orishas, and I'm going to do it only briefly, I'm going to be very philosophical in that rendering I have written. I want you to understand that the Orishas are really qualities and attributes of God as our ancestors saw them. They're not gods. Those of you who are in the tradition, don't get carried with that piece of wood that's carved so nicely, because it's just a piece of carved wood. Okay. Now, everything has energy, including wood. And there's a science on how to put energy in that wood that you can kind of extract later. But it's not about there. So we ain't going to pretend that. It's a piece of wood. It's a teaching tool. It symbolizes concepts, ideas, and principles. Let the wood go. Learn the concepts, ideas, and principles that are culminated in your character, and then practice them and teach it to others. And then you'll be able to move that with culture. But what I want to show is that we equated color and numbers and parts of our ecology and environment with each of those powers and forces. Color has to do with light and how light is absorbed or reflected by any element in the universe. All of us are made up of the same things, but each of us have a greater degree of one thing versus the other. For instance, I'm a child, I'm initiated to the deity they call Oya. Oya is supposed to be changed, right? Or the wind, we say wind, we don't you know, take but Oya really means change and process, right? <coughs> and anyone who's in the tradition knows there's a metaphor about Oya that says she marries Shango and becomes Shango's favorite wife. But then they say she became polyamorous, she also goes and marry Ogun and becomes Ogun wife. And we spend all of our time arguing about whether polyamory is right and polygamy is that, that's not even what this story is about. Change, which is Shango, must always marry change and process, which is Oya. And she must always marry Ogun, which is transformation as a result of change. So if we begin to study our ancestors' tradition, what you will find is what you call a religion is not really religion at all but a spiritual scientific system on how to build a human character so that it can balance itself and govern itself in this universe and be in charge of itself and not be a slave to someone else. You can go through them. To go through them is not really necessary. This, these documents are from a book by a brother named Baba Caraday and it's called um, Each of these are recent. These are seven. There's more than 401 of these powers. Now, what's important about the number is because at some point in history, 
our ancestors were able to um, find within the character of the human being and also within the character of nature itself more than 401 attributes that could be developed deliberately and was recognizable by some kind of way, ability to know it. We use seven over here because that's what we were able to work with given our condition in the Caribbean and Cuba and other places <coughs> and in North America doing the enslavement by the farmers. You know that. <coughs> this I put up because this also comes from Baba Carraday's book, um, Handbook of Yoruba Culture by Baba Carraday, K-A-R-I-T-A-N. But it's called Handbook of Yoruba Culture, Handbook of Yoruba Religion. And there's no such thing as Yoruba culture or Yoruba. There's something called Yoruba culture, but there's not something called Yoruba religion. Yoruba is an ethnic group. They don't own a religion. That thing we call Yoruba religion is universal to the entire continent of Africa. And it should not appropriately be called Yoruba religion. That is a mistake. If we would call that anything, even using the Yoruba language, we should call it Ifa, the wisdom of the universe or Risha, the power as displayed in our environment. So that was So it would be Ipa or Risha, I would find most appropriate. But the Yoruba is the people, just like Akan the peoples and Ga are peoples and farms are people and areas of people. They're not a religion. But in our cultural system on the continent, everywhere you go, you will find these stages of rice and passage. At birth, when a woman announced to the family she's pregnant, all kinds of ceremonies began in that family. All kinds of preparation began in that family. Okay? To prepare for the coming of the child, to take care of that woman, to make sure that she's healthy, make sure she's protected, to make sure the house is there, to make sure the husband's doing the right thing. The family gets together to make sure that they are prepared because a birth of a child is the coming into being of an ancestor. The next phase is puberty. We focus on that one, and we put a lot of time in the rites of passage around puberty, but that's only one stage of the rites of passage process. And between birth and puberty, which is around 15, 16, there's a training process institutionalized in the community that is continuous. You don't just call them in for a week or two and say you have the rites of passage, or even for a few months. It is a process that happens over years to prepare that human being to live in that culture. And then after puberty, you must prepare the person for marriage. Marriage was seen as an absolute necessity in the African community. We invented it for the purpose of organizing the nuclear family, for the purpose of creating the extended family, for the purpose of creating the community, for the purpose of creating the nation. And so marriage is something you prepare for, you're trained for. You know, sisters know you get these no count us, us, no count brother, we run the marriage, blah, 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 with all that talking, but we don't know. Nice, 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 nice. He did all that, walk, move, talk. And we don't know nothing about being a husband. We don't know nothing about being a father. We don't even know nothing about being a sex mate most of the time. Y'all got to teach us. So, you know, that's why it was important to train for marriage, both male and female. We don't do that no more. It's by accident. I love him. I love her. Well, he's so fine, she's so fine, I'm gonna track that. They ain't got nothing to do with what the end product gonna be. And by the time we get old enough to learn that, we kind of beat down that bad prostate. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the childbearing too. There's a period of training and preparation around childbearing for both the male and the female. And there's a process and there's institutions that's created for that educational process. And then we have to be trained to become elders. There are levels of elders, there are junior elders, there are mid level elders, and there are senior elders. And when death meets us, you're not supposed to be doing that old sorry seven day throw you in the ground, kiss you butt goodbye and be doing. That ain't right. It ain't right. I go to Africa, be, they be, I'll be hanging out at a funeral with a man dead in six months. The body laying out looking just good enough for six days. Now if they can do it there, we can do it here. Take time, bring the family together, discuss the problems, deal with the ills, deal with the pain, use the occasion to recreate the institution that the elder who's leaving tried to create. Use death as a rite of passage 
back to the creator that sent you forth in the first place. Now that's a good vibe, glad you're gone, I got something else to do now. That's almost the only thing to do. Go to the next These are the, the major arishas that we deal with, or powers of the being, or powers of God, or powers of nature. These are the European names for them. Um, everybody knows Oya, Shango, Oshun, Yamoya, Ogun, Legba, and Bakala. And we know that generally at Bakala we're talking about human intellect being developed deliberately. Uh, at Legba, we're talking about psychology. We're talking about psychoanalysis. Ogun, we're talking about transformation through a process. Um, Yamoya, you're talking about the notion of motherhood and nurturing something from nothing to something. You're talking about Oshun. You're not just uh, people love to throw that sensuality out there. But Oshun is more about being intuitive, being able to see beyond the intellect in terms of what the reality is going to be about. I mean, the story of Oshun, most people view her as a dainty little woman, but the story in the Yoruba tradition, the most grand story is the one about the village of war where none of the Amishas could stop the war with the women, and, and none of the elders could stop the war. So Ashun goes to the deity and says, oh, Udumari, oh, Uluru, give me a chance. Everybody laughed. The elders laughed, the Amishas laughed, everybody laughed. Said, oh, Ashun, you go carry your water and shake yourself and play your music and do your dance. But Ashun was given permission by God to go to see if she could stop the war that nobody else could stop. And she did. How did she do it? Ma'at. Ma'at. Oshun, we call it Ewa Pile in Europe. But Ewa Pile in Europe means the same thing that Ma'at means in Middle Nature. And in the Igbo, they call it Um Iman Nana. The very same thing, how many vowels with them to die. What she did, Oshun, when she got to the village, the women with that war, kicking butts with everybody, she started singing, dancing, drumming, playing her rhythm, creating harmony in the ecology and the environment. Women heard as a women. Not like us, because women is that symbol of balance. So when they heard the harmony and balance coming from Oshun in terms of her singing, her drumming, her chanting, her dancing, they began to sing and drum and chant and dance. And they began to migrate towards her. And then they began to dialogue about why there should be peace and justice among them instead of war. That's Mahat, whether you're doing it in Yoruba or Middle West. That's Oshun. Not just sexuality and breasts and hips as we seem to be destined to always betray us because our white European mind could only see it that way. And then we got Shango, of course, that's the courage to need to change spiritually. Not just change, but the awareness of the need for the courage that's necessary to start you on the journey to change. That's considered to be noble. That's why he has to be betrayed as a king. Because Oya, the tempest, the wind, you know, represents change in process. You know, when the wind comes and blows the stale wind, when the fresh air about. So those that's just cursed, but as we go deeper into them and the four hundred or three hundred plus others, you will find there were quality and attributes that if you want to be free, you must develop them in yourself and your offspring. Yes, sir. You just roll around to them. This is a point of black people down the black or the black God. And I want to never imagine it means exactly the same thing that the word Arisha means. You're familiar with the Orisha. Those who have traveled with Brother Tony and who have read his literature and his books are familiar with the nature. The word nature means excel, like, the nature root. Nature means the deity, God, except for one. And show that long before Moses in Egypt, we knew that the nature of God was one, but the essence of God was multiple. And so we knew that you, the nature of God as one was beyond any human comprehension, but his essence his attributes as expressed in your ecology was possible to know and to learn and to imitate and emulate. And so that is the next rule. Next. Too complicated for me to think. Let it go. That's it. That's it. Hunting and cultivating in a prepared way and a prepared medium the next generation. One quick thing about my brother's playing music because I know y'all do your own thing. See, when we couldn't speak Alcon, Airway, Dogon, Yoruba, farm anymore with our tongue, we took the, the tones and vibrations of our language and put it into music, using instruments. We knew then 
linguistically exactly what was being said by the African musicians in this hemisphere. We have lost it now. We respond to it, but we no longer understand the message. So what became our blues and our spiritual and our jazz and our rag and our bebop and our hip hop and so forth did not start as some sound to make us feel good. It started out as an innovation on our linguistics because we were not allowed to use the lingua franco from our vocal cords. So we took music, which was something we were already accustomed to at home because the way our history is recorded at home is on the drum. We keep history on the drum. There's a drum rhythm, song, that can go for thousands of years of recording without repeating the same arrangement of notes. It's a language system. We took that language system and transferred it to the saxophone and the guitar and the banjo and the washboard and all those other things we use. That was just an aside when you talk about how culture is the intellectual and artistic manifestation that characterizes society. And it also includes the rearing and the cultivating in a prepared way, in a prepared medium for the next generation. And I wanted to talk about the core, that spirituality is the core of this culture. But I want to define core, because I say core and everybody just assume they know what core is. But I'm going to tell you what I think core should be viewed as, and that's why y'all are going to buy the tape. The innermost part of anything, core, the essence of a thing. By essence, we mean the most significant part of a thing's nature. Meaning spirituality is the most significant part of the nature of culture. By nature, we mean the essential character of something. So spirituality, African spirituality, is the essential character of African culture. The permanent property or properties which determine and define the laws and the forces which govern change within a thing. That defines it and its in its cases mean conform, in this case mean to conform to a standard. Listen to this thing. Uh, when something is a core, it conforms to a standard set at its creation. What African culture is about then, and what African spirituality is about then, is to return to the standard set at the moment and time that the creator created the first African. That's what we try to get to and that's what our ancestors tried to pass on to us using all the different cultural forms, and that's what the enemy is determined to keep us from. See, and if we ever get back there, we home free. And we can if we're determined to get back there. So core means the innermost part of the individual or the collective being that contains the sum of the intrinsic properties without which a thing or person or group would cease to be what it is. And because we are missing those intrinsic properties, we have ceased to be what it is we really are. African people who are the first extension of God and human form on the planet Earth, and which are not affected, meaning those qualities, are not affected by accidental modification, meaning they're permanent in turn. The subject in which attributes adhere, meaning the qualities, the behavior, and the things we develop, this is the central pole which they all hold on to. But to really get culture in its right context and understand why core is so important, and the core spirituality must be understood, and I'll do this piece on spirituality. Spirituality is a systematic understanding deriving from our relationship to the Creator and creation, deriving from our ancestors' observation, examination, contemplation, and study of the universe, and its immediate environment and ecology. This, coupled with the intergenerational transmission of their knowledge, of their creation, and the memory of the time before the human began. That's important. A memory of the time before our human began. This allowed them to develop an understanding of their relationship to the rest of the universe and nature. It also allowed our ancestors to develop a process and a method for staying in harmony with all that exists. Our great ancestors of the Nile Valley, Egypt, and Nubia called this process or method Maha, true, justice, righteousness, harmony, and balance, and reciprocity. Our great ancestors of the Yoruba called it Iawakile, the science of building a good and gentle character 
through knowing and maintaining harmony and balance through just and righteous living. Our great ancestors, the Igbo, called it Imen Nala, the way of harmony and balance within and without. The spirituality in the final analysis is a result of condition, habit, practice, principles, concepts, ideas, and rituals that inform the culture, that instructs the society. African people, those societies that African peoples built. This body of knowledge is derived from being instructed and informed by our ancestors through intergenerational transmission of information. Of course, it is God, or Lutamari, the creator itself, that is our original and primary ancestor. Before anything came into being, only God exists. And if we were to be brought into being, there was nothing in existence to make us out of except pieces and bits of God itself. And that makes God our primary ancestor. It is God, only the Mary, the Creator itself, that is our original and primary ancestor. Thus, we are always aware of the fact that we are being, having a human experience. Yes, we are aspect of God itself having this human experience. That world of traditional African society we lived in, before the great destruction the Martha forced us out, was a totality, a whole. Its foundation is nothing other than the material and spiritual condition within which the African created and recreated their lives in various cultural, political, economic, and intellectual forms, which can be characterized as religious, spiritual, artistic, philosophical, etc. The word religion simply means to bind back. It is the process by which you bind back to your original state of existence. For traditional African society, all social, ca social categories and practices interpenetrate. When Africa in a traditional society is engaged in an artistic creativity, which the Igbo call Imen Enka, he or she believes they are being guided by the essence and the substance of God in and about them, which they, the Igbo, call their chi. Above all, in traditional African society, there's a reflection of the overall worldview of the African, which is the belief in a created universe in which life is a continuous process. African religions or religious and spiritual life is an integral element of their total cultural life, which aims at self-realization that consists of nothing other than living in harmony with the cosmic order, or what our ancient ancestors of the Nile Valley called Ma'at, and our great Yoruba ancestors called Ewa Pile, and our eminent Igbo ancestors called Omenna, harmony, balance, truth, justice, righteousness, peace, and respect for all that is. This should be developed within and without. To further understand spirituality, we must grasp the meaning of spirit. Now I need the time people that don't need the five minutes or ten minutes, don't just be sitting down 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 to do now. Spirit. Spirit is a symbol of the positive, energetic, forceful, qualitative, and formative aspect of the divine being's outpouring. In distinction from the passive, receptive, quantitative, form-taken aspect of life known as matter or the physical being. Spirit is the light side of being which imports qualities and motion, while matter or material is the form side of being which receives qualities <coughs> and motion. Spirit manifests in matter as the light molding the successive form. Spirit uses matter as a sheet or a covering or base which lies outside and below it. In their origin, Spirit and matter are eternal dualities that proceed from total unity, which is neither spirit nor matter, but the ultimate reality, which is God or the Mary itself. Matter exists, yes, me. Matter exists as structureless and unorganized form or shape beneath spirit. It is spirit that gives matter form, shape, structure, and organization. Spirit comes from the Hebrew word ruah, which means breath, and the Greek word pneuma, 
which also means breath or wind. Spirit is that part of the human being that is invisible and is characterized by intelligence, personality, self-consciousness, and will. And as I characterize spirit as light's energy, I'm using energy to mean having the power by which anything acts effectively to move or change other things or to accomplish any results. Spirituality then is a systematic understanding of your relationship to the rest of nature and the universe and the process and method for staying in harmony with all that exists. Again, knowing ma'at, ewasile, or omenela, when you become one, possessed with spirituality, derived from the wisdom of your ancestry, you develop a soul. A soul is that which exists when material or physical matter is possessed by spirit. This isn't something new. In ancient Kippur, they had the bar, the car, the crew, and they had some other levels. They knew about these three things. I'm only going to talk about three because I don't want to put too much in there that you don't really grasp. But you develop a soul. Soul is that which exists when the material or physical matter is possessed by spirit. That's why our great ancestors from the Nile Valley of Kemet and Nubia to the Niger River Valley of West Africa gave us these levels of beingness. Spirit, that's the mother principle or the divine essence. Soul, the father principle or the mind, mental essence. Body, the child principle or the material essence. Our great and reverend ancestor Kemet call them Aset, Asar, and Haru. You call them today Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And spirituality is a systemic arrangement. I wanted to just define system because we do take the brand new system everybody knows. But most of the time we don't, so I'm putting it on the tape. A system is an orderly, interconnected, complex arrangement of parts. A set of principles linked to form a coherent doctrine, a method of organization, administration or procedure, a group having the same or similar structure and which act as a unit in performing a vital function, an orderly combination of arrangements of parts into a whole, specifically such combination according to some rational principle and methodological arrangement of parts. And so when we think of a, a system and spirituality, we have to think of spirituality being a complex coming together of all of the aspects of the Creator itself and the degree to which you are willing to struggle to learn, identify, and adopt those aspects to you is the degree to which you elevate yourself to a divine behaving character as an individual that can form a divine behaving family when you pick a like mate and produce a divine behaving community as we once did in Kemet and Ghana and so many other places. And so I want to say to you, never forget, never stop giving the teachings of our ancestors. Just what are some of these teachings of our ancestors? We know they were used in the building and the sustaining of the world's first civilization, now Valley Kemet, and in the building and sustaining some of the world's oldest and greatest civilization, the Mahindadara of India, Monomatapa in Great Zimbabwe, ancient Ghana, Mali, Sanda, along the great Niger, the great Baluba, Angola, and Congo states along the Congo River the great civilization of Nubia and Ethiopia, the great all-night civilization of South America, the multiple civilized kingdoms of the Pacific and modern now New Guinea, Hawaii, etc. All of this, our ancestors teaching, allowed us to bring into being before the first Eurasian evolved out of the mountains and valleys of Central Asia along the Oxus River. At, at, at present, they Turkestan and Uzbekistan, those are the two cities that really define where they, this evolution and degeneration took place. But what teaching were these that allowed for us to accomplish so much 2,000, 5,000, 9,000 years ago? What are those African teachings that we have so forgotten or have lost completely that we find ourselves in such a pathetic state as a people, beggars at the feet of other peoples and other nations? Where are those teachings now when we find ourselves but mere holograms of true African men and women? Where are those ancestral teachings? when we have reduced ourselves to cheap imitation of counterfeit white personalities in blackface, while all the time dressing in the finest traditional attire, listening to good and varied types of African music, and performing and watching authentic African dance and drama. Yes, 
where are those teachings of our ancestors that we should never stop giving and that we should never forget? Is it in the teaching passed down to us by the happy now valley civilization, or is it in the teaching given us by the Yoruba, Igbo, Akan, Congo, Zulu, Mandan, Swahili, Ebe, Thon, uh, the Sudanic cultures of Mother Africa? Or all of these mere manifestations and variations on aspects of this great teaching? Do these cultures represent fragments of great ancestral teachings, or are they manifestations of these teachings reflecting the time? and natural ecology that these African peoples find themselves in at a particular time in history. From a general study of the histories of the very civilization built by ancestors, we are able to see certain institutions. The first being the individual. The individual is an institution. And you must build that institution using culture to instruct you in the ethical, moral, qualities and attributes passed down by our ancestors. The second great institution is the family, the nuclear family. When a man and a woman choose each other with the help of their parents, how stupid we are to think some little backwards child that we just fed and clothed and tell him was 18 could pick a mate. That's going to have him build the most significant institution for the rest of his time on the planet. <laughs> but we've fallen for that. But that's not what our tradition dictates. Our tradition says the families, the families, through study and understanding of the two human individual, choose the most suitable personality and character that can mate in a harmonious and unified way. And we need to get back to that. The third being the family extended, or the clan. The clan is a group of families that have bonded together because of, you know, culture and blood and so forth. That's why in Africa, Sheikh Abdiya spoke about the incest taboo that you didn't marry into your clan, because that was really your extended family. So you had to go find another clan to look for a wife or husband. Because we went into that incest stuff. <coughs> and we went into the homosexual stuff. And no need, we, we, no need for us to be playing that game. If there's a mental illness among us, just like there's physical illness, intellectual illness, and philosophical illness, we ought to address it as such and let our culture instruct and inform us on the appropriateness of how to do it. We shouldn't debilitate, reject, kill, or injure any of our brothers and sisters. That's totally inappropriate. And if you can't love the brother or sister who is a homosexual, <coughs> but you can love one who's got a religion or a habit or behavior that's even more inappropriate, then there's something wrong with it. But no, just as you will not accept inappropriate behavior on any other social or spiritual level, then we should not accept it on that level either. And we should restore the integrity of the African view and understanding of what life and life promotion and sustaining is all about. And where our people have been confused and misled by the horror and the terror of white supremacy and white genocide and cultural genocide and tyranny, then it is our job to comfort, to instruct, to inform, <coughs> and to heal. Otherwise, we're missing the boat of why we have consciousness in the first place. The fourth being, <coughs> institution being the neighborhood or the village. And what is a neighborhood? Neighborhood is nothing but a group of clans that got together and had to live in the same geographical location. They got a blood relationship, cultural relationship, language relationship. The fifth is a community. A community is a little different than a neighborhood, see. Because the community is not that you live in the same area, that's true, and that you speak the same language, that's true, you practice the same culture, that's true, but the community owns the land and runs the businesses on which they live. That makes it different from a neighborhood. See, in a neighborhood, you could be living there, but somebody else owns the land and runs the business. But a community made up of neighborhoods means you own the land and you own the business. So a lot of y'all, I know y'all came here today, thought you came from a community, but you didn't. You <laughs> came from a neighborhood, which is owned by somebody else. The sixth institution is the nation state or cultural state, as I think I have to say. The seventh and the final is the civilization that is created by these multiple spiritual states that have been created starting with an individual that had an African spiritual consciousness, maybe with an individual that had an African spiritual consciousness, 
produce the family that can produce the neighborhood community in the state. Through our study of our ancestors, we know they organize around three major institutions for group survival. And you always got to go here. Yeah, you can talk about spirituality and get hung out of the space if you want. But if you don't bring it back down to economic politics and culture, then you're hung out to dry. So the three major institutions, economics is the first. Economics is the study of the way in which natural resources are used and how the wealth these resources produce are divided and of the application of the underlying principle to the needs and prosperity of the community or society. So economics is the exploitation of the wealth <coughs> present in your ecology, using your knowledge to turn that wealth into riches for the community. And then there's politics. Politics. Now politics is, the so, is to sociology what economics is to ecology. Politics is the management system for your economics. R.E. law and regulations and the penalties for violating the laws, those laws and regulations, the laws and regulations put into place to determine how the wealth realized from the riches in the ecology and environment should be distributed, as well as providing the personnel to run the institutions of law and economics. <coughs> and of course, the third is culture. Culture is the psychology, what politics is the sociology, and economics is the ecology. Culture is the educational and spiritual system i.e. the socialization process determining our values <coughs> and principles, use and deciding whose interests we want these rules and controls to work. And of course, at the center of culture, I already covered it, and that's spirituality. If you say you got culture, and you have not put your African spirituality in some working relationship to your being, that ain't culture. Everybody's got a culture, but you may have an appropriate culture for your being's development. And many of us are practicing the culture of our enemy. We are practicing the culture of the rapist, the murderer, the kidnapper, the abuser, the antagonizers. And because of fear, we do it. And we tell ourselves it's appropriate, even though our husband's in jail, our son's out <coughs> doing inappropriate behavior, our daughter's being misused by the males of the community, and we have no control over none of it. And you, the sister, you left alone to carry the burden of the whole family and then being blamed because you're trying to do it and have to do the things you got to do to make sure it works. But we are too afraid, we made so afraid that we can't drop that fire of the enemy's culture and reach for the ice of our ancestors. Ooh. And if we don't, we'll die. Ooh. I'm going to go into conclusions. I'm getting to conclusions. I'm hitting that five minutes, but I'm going to run. We know that culture is the tool that is used to maintain group integrity and group cohesion. And at the core or the innermost part of culture, culture's essence or most significant part of culture's nature, the essential nature of culture, culture's most permanent property, that which we call spirituality, that set of standards, set of creation, is the gyroscope that keeps us balanced. Spirituality tells us that our essential and common destiny is to be Mahat, Yewapile, Omri, Truth, Justice, Righteousness, Harmony, Balance, Reciprocity. But our culture teaches that there are many paths to Mahat. Yewapile and Omanelli, each human being is possessed of certain qualities or sets of qualities which are attributes of the being from whom we were created. Each of these qualities have a number of paths. What I mean by path is a body of knowledge that when studied, understood, and adhered to will lead us to develop harmony and balance within and without. This becoming one in harmony and balance with our nature, our ecology, and our universe. Our ancestors of the Nile Valley called these powers, or qualities, and attributes, netics. Our Yoruba ancestors called them Orishas. Our Akan ancestors called them Obosun. We call them in English ethical and moral principles that use to build human character. We also identify aspects of them as forces in nature or forces of nature. When we are trained to identify these qualities and attributes and powers in ourselves and in our ecology, we are then able to allow ourselves to be instructed and informed by them in the development of our character. We are then able to recognize others in the same path. 
join forces with them to help restore Ma'at back to this earth and the universe to construct the cultural nation built with Ma'at, Iowa, Pili, and Omaneli as a foundation. Remember, foundation comes from found, which means to originate. So when we build the African nation on the foundation of Ma'at, Iowa, Pili, Omaneli, we are talking about building on what was established as our sovereign base at our ancestors' beginning, their original beginning. We are talking about those underlying principles on which one's belief is built. This gives us power, which is control and influence of our destiny. We then have the ability to define our own reality. These qualities and attributes that we must learn from a study of our ancestral history and culture to develop the individual character must also be used to develop the second level of human organization, the nuclear family, the male and the male female offspring and the third level, the human organization, the extended family of the clan, the fourth level of human organization, the community, a group of nuclear families. And again, to look and move that all the way up to nationhood. And then we must understand that the business that we have in our community must be controlled, and the essential services in that community must also be controlled by us. Law enforcement must be controlled by us. Education must be controlled by us and health services must be controlled by us. There can be no compromise if you're going to call yourself a nation and you're going to ensure your own survival on those issues. That fifth level of human organization I've talked about as nation, and I'm going to pass that, and I'm going to bring it to this last line. As these five levels of human organization is guided by those qualities and attributes handed down through culture by our ancestors, these same principles are applied to the effort of providing the essentials of building all of those pieces. The same principles that you use to build a human personality, you use to build a family, you use to build a clan, you use to build a state, you use to build a nation. The same principles. The same things we call a mission. They're not gods. They're not pieces of wood. Okay. They're, they're, they're not something you gotta go to Cuba to get, or you gotta go to evil land to get, or the river land to get. They're right here in this auditorium. They're all over Washington, everywhere you go. We may have to go home to the elders to get a deeper understanding of it, but where you will find them is wherever you are. And so why you go back and seek the knowledge is not to worship inanimate objects. That was never a part of our culture. We used inanimate objects as teaching tools. The concept is called anthropomorphism, where you use a symbol to represent something because it implies the meaning that you want to extract from the symbol. But if you get confused and start worshiping the symbol, you've lost your way. And you know, many of y'all go into church every week, and y'all worship a symbol that looks like this with a dead white man on it. And y'all so is with a dead white man on a symbol that looks like this, because y'all forget that it's useful to go and try to get an understanding of something called the Christ character, which is a set of quality and attributes that would elevate you to the level that you could be called a child of God himself. And so that may not be the best teaching tool because the symbol of your murderer is always in your face and it always blocks you from your space. So, I, want you to, I hope I impart some information that's useful. Um, the clarity is simply this. We are God. We are. And y'all scared, I'll do like this. I am God. <laughs> Having a human experience, people. Thank you.
So what we're what we've learned from last year is that we can't just give you this information, dump it on you, and expect you to keep walking straight. <coughs> you need to have a support system in place. So we have that for you this year. Um, I will tell you a little more about that, which will be uh, something to the tune of a study group, something you can go and you can ask some questions that you may have because we know that you have them, even if you don't know that you have them, okay? So um, let me just touch on, we need to do some little house cleaning. Can you please check your pagers, check your cell phones, cut them off. I neglected to say that in the beginning, but if you would do that, that would be um, a wonderful thing and not only wonderful, but respectful to our speakers. Um, so we appreciate that you would cut them off and just say, um, also FYI, okay, um, another FYI, uh, no food is allowed uh, in the auditorium, with the exception, of course, of water for our speakers. So um, let us move on, keeping us on task. 